Let's wait another two minutes uh, and, and we'll start. So, uh, <laughs> can you guys see the slides? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, and and you you have everybody's pictures on on the right. I I need to know where I can't write. Uh, I've got everybody's pictures on the on the top. On the top, okay. But that depends on how you how you display it on your screen. Full screen, <laughs> put the pictures on the side. I see. And I looked up yesterday how to fix your background so that you're in the Caribbean and posted a link. Yeah, I, uh, I'm i in my shed, which is uh, uh, now an, an office. So it's been kind of fun seeing people's houses from the inside. Um, so it keeps on telling me that people um, want to come in to the, yes. you guys are seeing that too? Okay, I, I might not be on that, okay? I'll, uh, I'll take care of it. Okay, thank you. Um, though I don't see. Um... So while we are on the, I think I have an issue. I, I don't see waiting room right now. I the only thing I see is uh, the. Is ah, this, okay. I think it's, it's empty. empty. Okay. All right. This is an amazing audience to give a talk to. Now I'm very nervous. Uh, Omar, a technical question. So uh, uh, the screen that you show has the slides. Yeah. yeah. Put the slides and you have uh, writing space. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, so I, I can um, I can write here. Let's see if it works. Cool. We'll see. We'll see how useful this is. This is my first time trying this. No. So let's ask everyone to turn off their mic unless they're speaking, just to minimize all the background noise. Yeah. And uh, if anybody wants to ask a question, they just unmute themselves, right? I'm not going to be monitoring like um, raised hands. Right, I guess we can start. So we have uh, Omer Tamush to today, and uh, he will speak about uh, uh, characteristics, me characteristic measures of symbolic dynamical systems. Okay, thank you very much. Um, please chime in with questions if you have anything. I think it gets a little bit boring to hear somebody read out their slides for an hour, so it's nicer if, it's, if there's a bit of a conversation. So um, please. So I. When I talked to Kate about this, um, she said that this should be sort of half seminar and half um, introductory kind of lecture. By looking at the participant list, I see that all the um, you know great people of our generation are here. So I, I think it, this might be a little boring for for all of you uh, uh, great experts. Um, but I am going to sort of introduce things slowly and then also talk about um, so, some new things. Part of the reason I'm going to do this is because it's just a really very little result. I think it's a, you know, it's a, it's a definition and there are questions. The result itself is, uh, is, is, is modest. Um, you can see the paper online. It's, it's all very short. Okay, so with that um, disclaimer, let me, let me start. Um, okay, so here, here's the plan for the talk. Um, I'm going to... Um, I'm going to introduce topological dynamical systems. I'm going to explain what an automorphism of a topological dynamical system is. 
Um, we'll talk about invariant measures, and then we'll talk about characteristic measures, which is what we're actually going to be studying here. We'll talk about what a symbolic dynamical system is. Um, and then we'll talk about automorphisms of symbolic systems. We'll talk about entropy of, of symbolic systems. And then we'll prove our main theorem, which says that zero entropy symbolic systems have characteristic measures. We'll prove another theorem, or we won't prove it, we'll just mention it, that minimal zero entropy symbolic systems have sophic automorphism groups. And then we'll talk a bit about extending this framework beyond just um, Z actions to group actions. Um, any, so there's somebody with their video turned on playing music or something. I don't know um, if, if, uh, if, if one of the organizers is willing to, to check that and, and mute this person. Uh, I'm muting everyone, but uh, some people are appearing and they have to mute them again. So I, I'm, I'm working on that. Okay, okay, thank you. Oh, and by the way, I don't know if anybody can see, but in the chat, I put a link to the slides. If you want to have the slides open another window and refer back to things, definitions that I've scrolled past, then you're welcome to, to, to do. Okay, so let's start with some definitions. Um, oh, I didn't record. I'm going to start recording this, sorry. Um, okay, now I don't know how to record. Um, ne ne oh, yeah, there we go. Um, okay, so um, let's start with some, some definitions. Um, ah, shoot. Um, now, now this, oh, this window is not closing now. Okay, sorry about that. All right, um, let's start with some definition. So what is a dynamical system? It's a pair X, T. X is gonna be a compact metric space. And T from X to X is a continuous bijection or homeomorphism. So this is not the most general definition. Um, it doesn't have to be metric. Maybe it doesn't have to be um, a bijection. But this is the, the, the framework that we're going to be working in. And I'll give some, some examples later. You know, I'll give a very simple example. Now let's test out this, this, this setting here. Imagine that X is the unit circle. And uh, T is a rotation. So T is going to take a point here and map it to some point that's alpha angles away. So, so, so T is a rotation. So, so that's one classic example of a, of a system. It looks like a three-year-old drew that. I'll try to, to improve my skills later. What's a subsystem? Um, a subsystem of XT is a closed, topologically closed, non-empty subset S, such that T of S is equal to S. So this is a subset that's preserved by T which means that if you just restrict, um, oh, sorry, that's a mistake. Sorry, sorry, it's a subset Y. That, okay, that's a silly notation. This should be a subset Y of X. <laughs> okay, so what is it? It's a subsystem is a pair Y, T, such that Y is a subset of X. That's, that's a mistake in, in my slides. So, so, so what is this? If, if this is the, if this is the space X, inside it, we're going to have a, uh, a subset Y that's topologically closed and such that T um, keeps points inside from Y inside Y. So it really, if you restrict X to Y, um, you, you, get a, you get another system, which is a subsystem of the original system. And we're gonna say that um, X T is minimal if it has no proper subsystem. So it really has um, no subsystems except um, except itself. Um, oh, now I don't know how to delete these things. There we go. Um, sorry, I'm, I apologize. I'm, I'm, I'm learning this as I go. Um, okay, and if you have, if, what are fixed points? A fixed point is a point that T leaves unmoved. And when you have fixed points, that's gonna be one example of a, of a, of a subsystem. Any questions about these definitions? I mean, these definitions, if, you know, if, if you've seen these things, this was a waste of your time. If you've never seen this, this might've been too fast. So it's useless, again, a waste of your time. Um, but, if, but this was meant for people who've, you know, maybe a long time ago have never seen this. So if, if you do have questions, please ask. Okay, now let's talk about isomorphisms and automorphisms of topological dynamical systems. So imagine that we have two systems. This is um, the system X. And it has this um, map T that maybe takes this point 
to this point. And we're going to have another system y. And this one has a map s that maybe takes this point to this point. So what, are, what does it mean that these are isomorphic, that these are really the same, the same system? Well, we're going to have some bijection that maps points in x to points in y. We're going to call this bijection pi. And we're going to want it to be continuous bijection because you know, we, we're working with topological systems. So we want to preserve the, the topology. But we also want to preserve the dynamics. If we're going to say that this, these two systems are the same, if, if the point on the left gets mapped to the point on the right, then their images also need to get mapped so that the, the, this transformation does, does the same thing to, uh, on, 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 on both sides. OK, what's an automorphism? An automorphism is just an isomorphism between x and itself, so between sort of two copies um, of x. Um, and um, this is going to be now a homeomorphism of x. Um, the, by, by the way, this diagram that I drew up here, the, the way to, to write it is, is, is what it says in the first bullet, that um, pi um, composed with t, with t is the same as s composed with pi. When, when s and t are really the same, and, and x and y are really the same, this just means that phi, if, if phi is an automorphism, then it commutes with, with t. Um, and these automorphisms form a group under composition, and we're going to denote this um, group um, the automorphism ot xt. And another way to think about it is just all homeomorphisms of x that commute with, with t. Um, okay, let's talk about invariant measures. Um, we're going to say that mu is a Borel probability measure. Uh, we're going to take mu to be a Borel probability measure on x. And we're going to define t star mu. Um, this is a new measure. It's another Borel probability measure on x. And it's defined as follows. This new measure, t star mu, if I want to know what measure it gives to a set A, then I take the preimage of A under t and take mu of that. So one way to think about it is um, I'm going to pick a point at random from x according to mu. Then I'm going to apply t to it. Now I have a new random point. The distribution of this new random point is t star mu. Okay, so so think about it maybe in terms of random variables is is easier if x is distributed like mu. X is now a random variable take taking values in the space x. Then t of x is distributed like t star mu. So if if anybody's used to probability terminology, then, um, then this is a nice way to think about it. So it's, it's, uh, we're going to say that mu is invariant if t star mu is mu. So after I apply this transformation, I get back um, the same distribution. So this is, this is what, what an invariant measure is. And uh, the proof is very simple. So I, I, what you do is you take the average of t to the n and by t to the n, I mean the n-fold composition of t with itself. So I'm going to take, um, I'm going to apply t n times to mu. Oh, sorry, that should say k. That's a mistake. So this, the, the exponent, the exponent here should be k. I'm going to compose, apply t k times to mu and take the average um, over k going from 1 to n. And then a very simple calculation shows that at the limit or a subsequential limit, if the limit doesn't exist, I get I get something that is um, th that is t that is invariant that t doesn't change. Okay, so here's the here's the the key definition. We're going to again take mu to be a Borel probability measure on x, and we're going to say that it's characteristic if phi star mu is equal to mu for all the phi in the automorphism group of x, of, of the system xt, right? So, we, so we're going to take each possible automorphism, apply it to this measure, and we're going to say that the measure is characteristic if it doesn't change for all the automorphisms of the, of the system. Now, remember that one way to think of the automorphism group is everything that commutes with t, and t commutes with t. So t is one of the automorphisms. So when you have a characteristic measure, 
this um, it's also going to be invariant because because t is also not going to change it. Later, when we talk about group actions, this distinction once once the group is not um, abelian, this this is in general no longer true, and you can have invariant measures that um, characteristic measures that aren't invariant. Um, so when when it came to invariant measures, I gave this very quick sketch of a proof that every system has an invariant measure, but this is no longer true for characteristic measures. So here's a, is maybe a very silly example um, of, um, um, of a system that doesn't have characteristic measures. I'm gonna take X to be the Cantor set and T to be the identity. So my, my, I have a very trivial dynamical system. I have the Cantor set and I do nothing to it. So what's the automorphism group of this? It's the entire homeomorphism group of the Cantor set. It's all the transformations that I can do with the Cantor set. And then it's sort of, standard and, and easy also to prove that there's no probability measure on the Cantor set that's, that's invariant to the entire automorphism group of the Cantor set. Um, here's an example of, of a system that does have a characteristic measure. Take x to be finite, t to be any transformation of, of, of x or any really just, just a bijection from x to itself, finite discrete, um, and take mu to be the uniform distribution. So just because all these automorphisms are bijections, this is not going to change. So this is a silly example, but actually it, it's going to be very closely related to our, to our result because it's going to be approximately what's going to happen in our, in our main theorem. Um, but I'll have more interesting examples later of characteristic measures. Um, and we'll talk about it. So, so, he, so this, this, the second example, the, the first example, the one with the Cantor set and T being the identity, is an example of a system that doesn't have a characteristic measure. Um, so, but this is sort of a trivial, it's, it's a trivial example. Somehow every, every point is a fixed point. So we can ask, are there minimal topological systems without characteristic measures? And um, we, I've had some correspondence with, um, um, with, with the gentleman li listed there, Nishant and Ilon and, and Benji, and they, they think they have an example of such a system, but um, I, I, I'm, I'm, um, that, that remains to be seen. Um, I, I, I don't completely understand their, their example yet. Um, maybe if one of them is on the call, I'd be glad if you, uh, if you commented. I don't, I don't know if, if, if any of these people are here. Um, I, I didn't define what a transitive topological system is or topologically transitive, um, but you can ask, if, if you want something non-trivial that doesn't have characteristic measures, you can ask, is there something transitive? And the answer is yes. So I'm, I'm not gonna define these things, but for those um, in, in the know, you, you'll, you'll understand. So I'm gonna take X to be the Cantor set C. Oh, no, that's not what I meant to do. Um, the, the, the Cantor, uh, sorry. Um, I'm, I'm gonna take X to be the Cantor set C. Oh, okay, that's supposed to be a C to the Z. Um, this, this tilted O is, is, is the Cantor set and T is gonna be the, the, the shift. I'll explain later what that means. Um, this, this is transitive, um, which, which, is, which is easy to see, but it's also easy to see that it, it doesn't um, have um, a characteristic measure because you can just, um, part of the automorphism group of, of this thing are, are any, um, is the, just the diagonal action of the automorphism group of the Cantor set. So I'm just gonna take some transformation in the Cantor set, some homeomorphism in the Cantor set and apply it to all coordinates. And this commutes with the shift and, and you can't have invariant measures because the projection on each coordinate is, is, is gonna have to be invariant. And, and um, so, that's, so that's impossible. So that's an example of a, of a topologically transitive system that doesn't have characteristic measures, but um, I, I don't know of a, of a minimal system that doesn't have characteristic measures. Okay, so any questions about, so this is sort of the key definition. And okay, I guess I should explain why we use the word characteristic. It's, it's, it's overused, so there are a lot of things in probability and in ergodic theory that are called characteristic. But I, I guess the, the inspiration is um, like a characteristic subgroup um, that, that is invariant to automorphism. So somehow 
if you have a, a measure that's characteristic, it somehow captures some deeply invariant, it's more invariant than just an invariant measure. Um, it really um, doesn't matter what automorphism you apply, what kind of symmetry you apply, this is still gonna, this is, this is, this is gonna stay as it is. And I'll, I'll give an example that maybe captures the spirit of this um, very fluffy thing that I just said. Um, any, any questions about this? I, I'd, I'd be glad to, so I'd be glad to, to have any questions or discussions. I think it'll, yep. it'll help. Uh, I, I'd, I'd like to weigh in here, uh, Lorenzo Sadoon here. Um, does, it sounds like the issue of there not being a characteristic measure is closely related to there being infinitely many ergodic measures. Because if you've only got finitely many ergodic measures, then then you know any transformation is going to have to swap among them, and you could take the average of them, and then you'd get uh, you'd get you'd get a characteristic measure. Yes. But that if you've got uh, infinitely many er ergodic measures, then you know, and you have a big enough you know big enough automorphism group to to essentially permute them in in kind of an arbitrary way, like your Canderset example. That's the sort of thing that's going to kill kill there being characteristic measures. And you can certainly come up with, with minimal systems with lots and lots and lots of ergodic measures. So that, that, that's a great point. Um, some topological systems are what's called uniquely ergodic, which means that they have a unique invariant measure. And in that case, that measure is going to be, um, is going to be characteristic. And like you said, if there are finitely many invariant um, ergodic measures, then um, you, you can take the average and, and that's gonna work the same. Um, we do, I, I will mention in a minute an example of a system that has a very large and complex automorphism group, in fact, a non-amenable automorphism group, and it has many, many, many invariant measures, but still has a characteristic measure. So, so th th there are some interesting examples, even when you have uncountably many ergodic measures, um, that you still have characteristic measures. Um, thank you. And any more comments or questions? Th this is ve it's very nice also because somehow intense to look at the camera and talk. It's nice to. I have a quick question, um, which I it, sent I to the chat as well. Oh, I'm not um, on the chat. Sorry, I I haven't been looking. Oh, it's okay. Um, so I guess I mean you you mentioned a little bit, so the answer is possibly no, but do you have any insight to what this counterexample of um, uh, Nishant and Benji and um, uh, Linden Strauss looks like? Yeah, so it, it's, it's a construction that they have in, in, um, um, in the Linden Strauss and Weiss paper on, um, on mean topological dimension. Okay. It's on page 10 there. And it, it needs to be slightly altered. Um, but yeah, I, I so 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 that that was their idea. Okay. Um, we maybe we should yeah I, we 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 uh, yeah. But I I I'm just not a hundred percent sure yet that I understand their idea. Okay. Um, anything else? Anybody? Okay. Thank you guys very much. Maybe you want to mute yourself for the people who 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 ask the question. Um, good. Okay. So I'm gonna continue. Um, please just chime in if you have any questions. I'm, I can't look at the chat. It's too many things for me to mention, to, to monitor. So uh, other time. Okay, so what's a symbolic system? We're going to take A to be a finite alphabet. So maybe say um, A is A, B, Z. And um, we're going to let X be Z to the A equipped with the product topology. So what's our, our space X? It's a space of labelings of Z. So this is going to be Z, maybe this is zero, one, and so on. And we're gonna label each element of Z with with um with with one of the of the elements of our of our alphabet. And here we have we have the product topology. So okay, if anybody hasn't seen and doesn't have a good feeling for what that means, but the product topology here means that a sequence of these labelings converges if it gets fixed on every finite subset. So eventually everything between minus n and n gets fixed for, for each n, and this, this is compact and, uh, and, and metrizable. And t is going to be the shift. So what, is, what does this t do? When we apply t, 
um, we're, we're just going to shift this to, to, to the right. So in this case, we're going to get Z, A, A, B, Z. Okay, so, so this is a continuous uh, bijection and, um, and, and um, this is called the full shift. And if we look at subsystems of this, um, they're called shifts. Sometimes they're called subshifts. I'm just gonna, I'm just gonna call them shifts. So what's what what is that, what's a subsystem? It's gonna be some set of labelings that's topologically closed and invariant to to shifting because that's that's our operation. Okay. So what do the automorphisms of these sort of things look like? Well, what does continuity mean? So let's let's imagine now that I have um, an automorphism of this thing. So, so I have an automorphism phi. Um, I, I, I don't know exactly what it does. Okay, one of them is obviously the shift, but we're gonna have a, a different, um, let me draw this more nicely. We're going to have a different automorphism phi. So it has to be continuous and it has to commute with the, with the shift. What does continuity mean in this topology? It means that when I wanna calculate the label here, I want to, you know, maybe I calculate this and given the, the input, the, the label here is B, this can only depend on some finite number of coordinates. So without loss of generality, we can imagine that, that B depends on some window taking K to the left, so a window of size 2K plus one. It depends on K coordinates to the right, K coordinates to the left, and one coordinate, um, one coordinate above. So, so, so this k, a, just if we just, if we just want continuity, then this k can depend on which coordinate we're looking at. But just because phi is continuous means that in order to calculate what the label is of coordinate one, I there's going to be some k where I have some function of the coordinates above, and I'm, I'm going to call this function p. So, so it means that phi of x evaluated at the coordinate one is gonna be some function P of, or let's make it at the coordinate zero, it's gonna be some function P of X minus K up to X K. Now, what does it mean that this commutes with a shift? It means that this function, that when I calculate every other coordinate, I really use the same function and I just translate the window. So, so over here, I'm gonna have the same window K and the same function p, and I'm going to apply to, to calculate this coordinate. So that's what's written in the slide. Um, phi of x at coordinate n is some function p of the original x's and a window that goes um, to, to, to k in each direction. So that's the Curtis Headland Linden theorem. And we're going to call this k, the size of the window, the memory of, of, of phi. So, so each phi is really characterized by some such function p, and each 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 one of these p's is just a function from a finite set to a to a finite set, right? P is from a to the two k plus one to a. So there there are countably many um, such automorphisms. Okay, so so we get this countable group here, which is nice because we started with a with a, with a Cantor set. Um, this z to oh sorry this this was a mistake up here. This this is a to the z. A to the z is, um, is, is, is the Cantor set. It has a very large automorphism group, but, um, but we get, but the, uh, of the entire Cantor set. But if we just look at the automorphism group of, of, of the system, it's going, to, it's going to be countable. And here's the question, are there any symbolic topological systems without characteristic measures? So can, so this, I don't know the answer to this, find any symbolic system, so any shift, start with a finite alphabet, look at a closed shift invariant subset, find one that does not have a, um, a characteristic measure. So let's look at the full shift. Um, the, the full shift, um, has a very large automorphism group. The, the automorphism group is non-amenable. So this is something that, that I haven't talked about, but well, maybe Lewis mentioned this in, in, in his talk, but when you have an amenable group acting on a, on, on a compact space, you're always going to have an invariant measure. 
because the automorphism group of the full shift is non-amenable, a priori it's not obvious that there are measures there that are characteristic, which is invariance to the, to the automorphism group. However, for the full shift, it turns out that there is a characteristic measure. So let me talk about that for a second. Before that, let me, let me introduce entropy because this is going to be important for us. Um, I'm going to take a shift, xt. So now x is some subshift of um, a to the z. And I'm going to denote by br the words of length r. So th these are all strings of, let of symbols of, of, of in our alphabet that are of length r and that appear in the shift, right? So these are, um, if, we, if we go back up here, um, in, in this, in this uh, example, z, a, a, b, z is a word of length five that, that appears. And the way I defined it, I, I want x1 to be y1 and so on, but if I took x2 to be y1 and so on, if I shifted it by one, it, it, it would all be the same. So, um, so a shift is in fact defined by the set of all finite words that, that, that it includes. Um, so what's the entropy? The topological entropy of, of, a, of a shift xt is the limit as r goes to infinity of the log of the size of the r, the log of the number of words of length r divided by r. This limit always exists by subadditivity. It's also equal to actually the infimum of this, of this expression. So I could just take in the infimum. Um, so th this is the same as the infimum over r of log the size of br divided by r. Um, and the beautiful thing about entropy is that if I have two isomorphic shifts, then they're going to have the same entropy. So the, the way I defined entropy here, it's not, it's, it's defined, it's not a, a purely topological definition. Um, I'm actually using a particular way of thinking about this Cantor set and this transformation, but it turns out that it is really a, 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 a dynamic property that's preserved under isomorphisms. Okay, so where are we going with this? Um, I'm gonna look at the full shift. So again, this is a to the z here, sorry. And um, the entropy of that is very, it's very easy to see that it's just log the size of the alphabet because how many words are there of length r? It's exactly the size of the alphabet to the power r. I'm taking the log of that and dividing by r. So actually this entire sequence, this limit is, is, is constant in this case. Now, if I have an invariant measure, I can, I'm not gonna go into this, but I can define um, uh, a measurable notion of, of entropy by, by looking at the Shannon entropy of the first R coordinates and then dividing by R and taking the limit of that. And it turns out that the measurable entropy of an invariant measure is always at most the topological entropy. And that um, if, if I have an invariant measure mu and I apply some so I'm looking now at the at the third um, bullet from the bottom. If I apply some trans some automorphism to it, the the measure the the entropy is going to preserved is going to be preserved. Now it also turns out that the uniform IID measure. So right, I I can take just the product distribution on a to the z by choosing each coordinate independently from the uniform distribution on this finite set a. That's a measure that's invariant to to translation. And its, its measurable entropy is the same as the topological entropy, which is just log A. And this is the unique measure with um, that entropy. And therefore, it has to be characteristic. Okay, so more generally, if you have a shift with a unique measure of maximal entropy, that's going to be um, a characteristic measure. So th this was sort of, these were a lot of big steps. So if anybody has any questions or if you want to think about it for a second. Um, so so, so this, this is one example, but there's actually a large class of shifts, um, you know, the let's see, mixing shifts of, of, of finite type um, that all have unique measures of, um, of, of, uh, of, of maximal entropy. That's probably Boylan and Rudolph. So all of these are going to have characteristic measures, even though they have very large non-amenable automorphisms. Any questions about this?
there are some comments in the uh, oh, chat yeah. section. Um, let's see if I can look at that. Um, but I guess for some reason because I'm sharing my screen, I don't have a, a button to see the chat. Do you want maybe Kate? Do you want to choose a question and ask it, or or tell people? You know, um, it's more like comments uh, for the uh, for the talk. But I, I guess we can just move up, move on, and then uh, at the end of the talk we can um, read those and maybe answer. Yeah. Okay. Uh, I, if if I have any mistakes, I, I I would like to hear. So please chime in and just ask me if you also if you have any comments, please please let me know. Um, Okay, so with that in place, let me tell you. Um, yeah, Kate, Kate why, why don't you give us a comment or two? I think if, if there's anything interesting, I, I'll be glad for a short break to hear what people are thinking. Um, I I think uh, well, th there is a there is a nice comment from Lorenzo. I don't know if he wants to to tell it now. I think it's a good point. Well, I, I think that your next theorem says that my comment can't work. So I want to understand your next theorem. <laughs> <laughs> OK, so let's let's talk about the theorem then. Um, here's the theorem. Um, take a shift that has zero entropy. Um, then it has a characteristic measure. OK, so every zero entropy shift has a, a characteristic measure. And just to understand the statement of the theorem, x here is a subshift of a to the z? Yes, x is a subshift of a to the z. Exactly. Okay, thank you. Yep. Uh, is, your, is your subshift minimal, Homer? Uh, it doesn't have to be minimal. For this result, we don't need minimality. But it can't be the trivial. Oh yeah, yeah. Sorry, never mind. I understand. Okay. Um, okay. So let, let me let me give a little bit of background. Um, so there there's a very nice related paper by by um, Brian Akron and and Van Sir where they look at automorphism groups of zero entropy shifts. And for a very large class of zero entropy shifts, not, not all of them, but for a very large class, I think minimal maybe. Um, so not every zero entropy shift, but um, shifts where the number of words, so what does zero entropy mean? Well, it means that the, the number of words of length R grows sub-exponentially, and they require just a little bit more than just sub-exponentially. Um, but for these sort of um, shifts, they show that the automorphism group is amenable. Now, once the automorphism group is amenable, we know that there's going to be a characteristic measure. So, and, and they conjecture, um, co correct me, both Brian and, and Vanner here, if, if anything that I'm saying is, is wrong, but um, they conjecture that um, zero entropy shifts all have um, amenable automorphism groups, and this maybe somehow supports, supports this conjecture. Definitely, if we'd found an example of a zero entropy shift without a characteristic measure that would prove that the conjecture was was false. Um, okay, uh, Brian, uh, Van, do you, do you guys want to chime in, say anything? Um, that no, that you you said it correctly. I put in the chat what the assumptions were, which is that we assume minimality and stretch exponential with the exponent less than one half to get amenability. Um, okay. Okay, thank you. Um, okay, so so let me give you a, a quick outline of the proof. Um, well, okay, let me let me before um, before I give you the outline. Okay, um, let 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 me draw a little picture. So we're going to have a shift, which, like we said, is a is a labeling. Um, Is a labeling of Z by 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 elements of this of this alphabet, um, and what we're going to do is we're going to look at words of length R, and we're going to place them in a particular place. So we're going to say, look from we're going to take a window of size R, say around around zero. It's important that it's always around the same point, 
and we're going to define a distribution on words of length r. And now you can use this to define some distribution on, on x by taking each word of length r and completing it somehow to some infinite word, to, to some infinite labeling. So if I give you distribution, um, let's call it mu tilde, this is a distribution on br, I can get from that a distribution mu on x. I can get many distributions mu on x, but um, I, I, I want to pull it back to a distribution so that when I project it on the ball of radius r on br, then the words of length r, then I get mu, mu tilde. But the way I'm going to construct this characteristic measure is for each br, I'm going to define a measure mu tilde r. I'm going to pull that back to a measure mu r on x. And then I'm going to take a limit or a subsequential limit of these measures mu r. D d does that make sense? OK. So the space is compact, so every sequence of measures is going to have a, a, a converging subsequence. OK, so how, how does the proof work? So what does zero entropy mean? So one way to think about it is that the number of words grows sub-exponentially. Here's, here's another way of thinking about it. It means that for large r, if I tell you, um, if I give you a word of length r and ask you how many words are there of length uh, that fit in a window of length r plus, say, 2k or 2k plus 1, that should be just r plus 2k. There's going to, for most words of length r, there's going to be a unique way to extend them to a word of length r plus 2k. That's what zero entropy, this is sort of, you take that as a working definition of, of, of zero entropy. So formally, if you look at the number of words of size r plus 2k divided by the number of words of size r, this is going to tend to one as r goes to infinity for any choice of k. Okay, so we're going to take some phi with. Um, okay, so what 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 is going to be what is going to be mu hat r mu um, hat r is just going to be the uniform measure on br. Okay, now to avoid a lot of epsilons in calculation, let's just imagine that for some particular r, there's only one way to extend each word of length r to a word of length r plus 2k. Okay, so, you know, at the limit, this is sort of true, right? Because the ratio between the sizes of the, the by, by the way, the, the, the set br is a subset of the set br plus 2k. So that's always gonna be a larger set. At the limit, they have very similar sizes, or the ratio between their sizes goes to one, but just to make the proof simple, let's just imagine that they have the exact same size. Then what happens when I apply, so, so now I wanna apply um, an automorphism phi, and I have here a word of length r, so this is r, and I wanna know what phi is gonna map this to. Now, in general, when I apply a phi to calculate this coordinate, I, I, I look at some radius k. So this coordinate, I don't really care. If I just know what happens in radius r, in the ball of radius r, I, I'm going to know what this coordinate is going to say. right? So here I have some particular word, and I want to know what phi does to it. But here on the edge, I don't know what this is going to get mapped to, because it depends on what happens here. So, so phi doesn't really take words of length r to words of, of length r. It depends how you extend it to words of length r plus 2k. But we're saying that there is a unique way to extend. And this is going to be true for almost every word. Just imagine for a second that it's true for every word. If there is a unique way to extend a word of length r by k on each side, then given the word of length r, I know exactly what its image under phi is going to be. So what we get here is that under this sort of 
silly assumption that these are exactly the same size set, we get that phi just permutes the words of length r. So if we now pull this new r back, we find a representative for each word of length r. Um, phi is just going to, to, to permute these representatives. And, and in particular, it's going to preserve the uniform distribution on VR. So this is related to the fact that I said in the beginning, if you have a finite dynamical system, it is going to have a characteristic measure because the uniform measure is going to be preserved. So this is what's really happening here. Well, up to some epsilons, because I'm making this, this, this assumption, that really up to some epsilons, phi is just um, a, a bijection from this finite set VR to itself. So if we take the uniform measure on VR, that's just going to preserve, be preserved under phi. And this holds for each phi. So each phi is going to have a different k. But if we go to r large enough, this is going to hold for, for each phi. Well, it's going to hold for each epsilon and each k. And at the limit, everything is going to work out. OK, so that's basically the proof. Um, writing it down is, is somehow a lot more painful. And I think reading it in a paper is more painful because it's hard to uh, well, okay, maybe looking at this picture in my talk is also painful. I don't know, but um, I, I, I think it's probably more painful in the, in the paper. Um, so it turns out that this, this idea can be used to prove another result, namely that when you have a minimal zero entropy shift, then the automorphism group is so thick. So I'm not going to define these things. I guess Lewis talked about them for wh whoever was there last time. But for those who know what, what, what these things mean, um, I've already shown you basically what, what is the Sophic approximation going to be. I'm just going to look at the action on these sets VR. I need minimality because when xt is minimal, so xt minimal means that, ought, that phi um, does not have fixed points. So in automorphism pi, phi has no fixed points. Well, why is that? Because a fixed point of an automorphism is a, the set of fixed points of, of an automorphism is a subsystem. If you look at the set of fixed point of an automorphism, that's a sub of, of any topological dynamic, that's a subsystem. So if I have a minimal system, the set of fixed points is either everything, in which case T, in which case the automorphism just does nothing, is the identity, or there are no fixed points because we don't have any, any proper subsystems. So, um, so this minimality gives me that phi has no fixed points, so it really acts, it acts freely, and that's another thing that I need for these Sophic approximations. Okay, so I'm almost done. Um, let me just tell you a little bit about group actions. Okay, I, I think I'm gonna skip the definition, because if, if you haven't seen this, then, um, then, then really th this is gonna be a lot to take in, but I'm gonna have a countable group G, and it's going to act by translations on A to the G. And this is going to be the, the full shift. And then, as before, I'm going to have subshifts, which are closed G invariant sets. And the automorphism group is, again, all homeomorphisms of, 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 of XG that commute with all the elements um, of G. And initially, we thought, OK, if we take G to be very big, take G to be, to be the free group, we might be able to find um, a shift on the free group that doesn't have any characteristic measures. And we also failed in that. So that's another question that I don't know the answer to. Find any group and a shift on any shift on any group that does not have characteristic measures. So the issue with that, there's sort of a, okay, so, 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 so what's going on here? If you, how do we construct things that, in, in general, how do we construct um, spaces that don't have invariant measures, right? Well, having no characteristic measures then means that you have a space where the automorphism group doesn't have invariant measures. So one way to do that is to is to look is to construct proximal or strongly proximal spaces, and these don't have invariant measures. But strongly proximal spaces have trivial automorphism groups, and then they're going to have characteristic measures because just take any measure; it's going to be characteristic because the automorphism group is trivial. So there's some tension between the techniques that we have constructing spaces without spaces that don't have invariant measures. So sorry, if, if I, if I want to have a space that, um, 
sorry, now I, I, I need, this I, I didn't have written down and I need to, to recall one, one second. Um, so um, I, I, I apologize, I'm, I'm gonna need another second here. Okay, so, so, so he, here, here's a theorem. Um, so this is very easy to prove and it highlights this tension. Theorem, let um, GX be free. So this is a topological system without any, any fixed points. Sorry, let me write that better. So I'm, I'm, I'm gonna take any topological dynamical system X, that's a group action, so G is, is acting on it, and it's gonna be free, so it doesn't have any fixed point. The theorem is, um, then the automorphism group of XG um, does not act proximally on X. Okay, so So, so, so there's, there's some tension be between these things. Um, so we don't know about any shift for any group. We also don't know about any minimal topological system for any group that does not have characteristic measures. So these questions that are, that are open for Z are in fact, as, as, as far as I know, open for, for any group. Um, and, uh, you know, I, th th this, these questions are the result of, of, of Josh and I thinking about this for, for a bit, so maybe they have, they have easy answers. I, I, I don't know. It might be that they're very easy and it's our shortcomings. Um, I think I'm done. Um, I, I'd be glad to open it to any questions. Let me stop the screen sharing so I can look at the chat. Um, um, my, I'm glad. Um, I'm, I'm glad to to take any questions. Uh, maybe a very short question. Uh, so, you prove some sophisticity of certain groups, and uh, is this clear that these groups uh, uh, are not simple? Um. Or, or, or they actually? Are. I think we know very little about these groups in this generality. Um, I mean, the simple as algebraically simple. And no, yeah, I know. I, 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 I don't know anything in in this generality. Um, may, yeah, maybe Brian now or or Van or somebody else can can say something. Um, there, there are a few people here who know, who know a lot about these things. Um, Not in this generality, though. I think there's nothing. At least in the generality of you know all zero entropy, we don't we don't have results. Yep, I agree with that. So so uh, Van and Brandon, so for for the stretch exponential minimal shifts, do you know more algebraic properties of these groups except that they're amenable? Uh, yes. No more. Um, we, under some assumptions, you can get some growth estimates on them. Um, and if you make strong enough assumptions, uh, those growth estimates give you um, uh, polynomial growth, for instance, um, or at least, you know, various forms of sub-exponential growth. Um, so you can do those sorts of things, but we don't have great results that say, like, um, uh, the uh, commutators look like blank or, or something along those lines. These are assumptions on the growth of the shift. Yes. Right. They're all stronger than zero entropy. There are some more comments in the, in the chat section. OK, so Gabor, that's a great question. And I think Andy, um, oh, and I see that Andy has a paper on this. Um, so Andy, do you want to comment more? 
Sure. So I have a I have a paper where um, you take any pair of infinite countable groups G and H, and you can construct a minimal G flow uh, where H embeds into the group of automorphisms of that minimal G flow. And I will remark that this um, the construction just completely blows up the alphabet. You, it's a shift on a cancer space alphabet, so there's no hope of this being a subshift or anything like that. Okay, thank you. Um, I see another question here. Um, yeah, so so maybe, maybe Lewis or Kate want to answer this question. I, I mean, in general, so this, you know, the if if you construct an action like that, it it doesn't necessarily mean that. Um, that you can have an invariant measure. Um, it's a good question. I, I need to think about it, I guess. OK. Uh, I believe that uh, during the recording, uh, we don't record the chat section. So I, I think it's better to to, to, to pronounce the, the, the questions. I see, I see. Um, so, so the question is, um, is there any link between the sophisticity of odd xt and the existence of the characteristic measure since the two of them are implied in your theorems through the same kinds of proofs other with conditions on entropy? Um, yeah, so, so my answer was I, right now online, I'm, 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 I'm blanking out a little. I, 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 I think that if you can construct um, if you can construct this the sophic approximation on the words of length r, then you can you can also have um, you can also have characteristic measures, but perhaps the group is sophic sort of for other reasons, not not that particular construction, and then these things wouldn't be wouldn't be related. Um, and Brian has said there's some countable groups that we can rule out for being in the automorphism group of zero entropy shift, for example, anything with exponential distortion. Um, any, any more questions, any more comments or thoughts? Just a general question. What's the motivation for considering characteristic uh, measures and what's why why is this the right question to ask I mean you've given us some really pretty answers well, well what's the motivation behind the question uh, yeah I, I, I don't know um, somehow you know the fact that the fact that say the a, a, a unique maximal entropy measure is characteristic somehow, it's like a characteristic subgroup. It's a special measure on this thing, you know, um, beyond just being invariant. Um, you know, why care about invariant measures? You know, why care about dynamical systems? I don't know. I, I think it's, it's just pretty. I, I like the question better than any of the answers that I've given. I feel like the answer is very small. The question is what's interesting, but uh, I'm not sure how to convince somebody who um, just thinks that this is completely pointless. Just to be clear, I'm not one of those people who thinks this completely pointless. I don't think that I have any motivation beyond this. I, this, this didn't come up in some study of some other object or anything like that. Thanks, Omer, for this very nice talk. I, I wonder what is the procedure to clap to the speaker if we are in <laughs> online mode. Shall we like uh, unmute and clap? There's a reactions on the bottom you can clap. Okay. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank uh, you. Thanks, Omar. <laughs> Thank <you>. Yeah. <laughs> thanks. <laughs> Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.